say for me, I have had to just really enjoy being underestimated. <laughs> <laughs> I don't own a suit, I don't wear dresses, and uh, you know, and over all these years, I've just learned to, to love that. You've built multiple multi-million dollar businesses which you founded. You've been an inspiration for black women in business. But let's go back to your childhood in Missouri and start there. So I grew up in a large Mormon family. I'm the second of seven kids. Seven kids. Yes. Uh, in a town called Liberty, um, which is just outside of Kansas City, pretty rural small town. Needless to say, I was it was not a great fit for me. I was an odd, curious kid, and that was more of a Friday Night Lights football town. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so Liberty was was uh, good for me because it gave me a ton of time, living there gave me a ton of time to read and explore my own curiosity. But the big inflection point for me was when AOL chat rooms came out um, because all of a sudden it opened up this whole world to me. So AOL, dial-up internet connection. Dial-up internet connection. I had to you know, beg my dad to get us a second <laughs> phone line. But um, it was the, the first time where I really felt like I belonged somewhere, where I found like other geeky kids all over. That so like what, what chat rooms were you, were you on? What uh, were your favorite <laughs> AOL dial-up chat rooms? Uh, let's see. Well, there was one on like fiction, like I'm a big fiction reader, I like mysteries and that sort of thing. Um, and then just other like weird kids and hanging out, just talking about stuff. So, um, and then, you know, was a big No Doubt fan, so the fan fan club uh, of that. What is your favorite No Doubt song? Ooh, um, probably Don't Speak. Have you ever seen them live? Yes, a couple times. That was actually my first concert I ever went to. No doubt. Yes, yeah. So through internet chat rooms at the kind of emergence of, of the internet, you kind of found belonging in these communities. I did, yeah, because, you know, being, at, at the time I didn't even realize I was a gay kid in my Mormon family and in my small town. Um, but, you know, I definitely was trying to sort out who I was and, um, you know, finding a place, because I didn't belong in my school, I didn't belong in my church, and finding um, the, like, the internet really allowed me to kind of find a voice, or start finding my voice anyway. And seven siblings who are all just about as tall as you are? They are taller. I am the short, I am the short one in my family, which is why I keep my hair. <laughs> but short is relative, you're like six foot? Yeah, I'm 5'11". 5'11", yes. okay, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I have an older brother, five younger sisters, and they're all taller than me. But I'm the smart one. <laughs> <laughs> and you tell them that? Yeah, totally. Okay, cool. <laughs> and did you have to like look after your Younger siblings yeah, growing so up? Yeah, so I'm um, 12 years older than my youngest sister. And you know, a lot of people are like, how does, work, how does it work to have seven kids? And the reality is that the oldest ones take care of the youngest ones. So people thought my youngest sister was mine uh, because she was always you know, on my hip and I was always helping take, to raise her. And she and I are really, really close. I think it sounds similar to, to how I grew up. So I grew up in a kind of super conservative, super religious family in a very small, village where everyone's mindset was the same and I love those people those are my people but at the same time I just felt that it wasn't my kind of world beliefs and view system and I didn't quite fit in there and I mean how does how do you think that has helped you evolve into the business person you are and not quite fitting in at that age? I think um, because I I knew I didn't fit I had to really dive into what does fit and what you know to, to define myself in a lot of different ways. Um, so, you know, in, from my upbringing, you know, my mom always had us focused on doing service projects and we're not a musical family, but she'd take us to the nursing home to go entertain the, the folks living there. And we were so bad, like my sister Kelly would clunk on the piano and we're not good singers. So the second time we went to the nursing home, this old woman with no legs wheeled herself out and said like, oh, not them again. <laughs> but, um, you know, so there's a lot of things in my upbringing, like my parents, my dad was a super hard worker and my parents really focused on, you know, teaching us the value of hard work and serving others and having integrity. And those values have translated really, really well as things that I've, that are part of the center of my uh, moral compass and how I, how I function, which over time in business has, has made a lot of sense. And I think a lot of people who have done well in, in business, especially entrepreneurs, have gone through a period where they don't fit in somewhere. And I think if you don't fit in somewhere, you put less emphasis on what 
people around about you think. And I think that's just a key quality in business. You've got to not give a damn what anyone thinks. You've got to be a little bit numb to people's feelings sometimes. And I think going through a period where you don't fit in almost develops that quality. Oh, absolutely. I would say that I've had a fuck you attitude. <laughs> <laughs> I was really young. Uh, <laughs> because I just had my own views and my own way that absolutely were not acceptable. And, um, you know, so I think, you know, I, I became, have become fearless on expressing what I think and knowing that, you know, like I've, I've faced a lot of consequences for that and, and realized that that's not gonna kill me to, <laughs> to just have my own views and be adamant about them, uh, but also receptive uh, to in, in learning. I've always been intensely curious and intensely willful. And I think consequences are never quite as bad as you think they're going to be. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you went from uh, Missouri to the military. Yeah, yeah. I joined the army to get control over my education. My parents were hoping to ship me off to find a husband <laughs> and uh, focus on my future as a wife and a mother. Um, they never really imagined that I would have a wife who is a mother. So <laughs> got a little bit derailed from my mom's plans for me. But uh, yeah, so joined the army to... to kind of forged my own path and it was a great context for me to gain my independence, learned a lot about myself and really pushed my, it really pushed me intellectually and physically and emotionally and and I, you know, just, I was, I realized I was way ca more, or capable of way more than I ever, ever imagined I was. And I think anyone who starts a business, that resilience needs to be like so ingrained in their DNA and it's a quality that you have in like massive quantities. I mean, did any of that come from your time in the army? Absolutely. I mean, I think it came from growing up in my family and being resilient because my family didn't have a lot of money. So, you know, I had to just hustle if I wanted anything. And then in the army, being adaptable and resilient is the only way to really function. And then it just gave me this really big boost of self-confidence that I didn't really have from my upbringing. So your unusual journey then goes on to Syria where you studied? Yes, yes. So I ended up getting an academic fellowship after I got out of the army and lived in Damascus for two years, which was an amazing experience. This is before all of the madness happened <laughs> where it was really yeah. emerging as a, as a great country. And uh, it, was, it was just an awesome opportunity to travel throughout the Middle East and around the Mediterranean and meet amazing, wonderful human beings. And then your journey takes you from Syria to Columbus, and then you start, as you put it in your own words, hustling. Yes, yes. So <laughs> hustling on the streets. Yes, yes. So that's about um, 10 years ago now. So I came back and was washing dishes and bartending and serving and was doing some freelancing as well on the side. I've always had you know, a bunch of different jobs yeah. and ended up freelancing for a couple of guys that were making money on the internet through affiliate marketing. And I thought, wow, like they, in my perception at the time, were making a lot of money. And I thought, well, they're not like that smart. I can probably figure this out. And so that was sort of the step, the first step in building something. So I got into affiliate marketing and built a portfolio of stuff and ultimately sold that. Um, but it was, yeah, it was just this inflection point where I thought, okay, I don't necessarily want to stay in the restaurant industry as a server and bartender for my whole career. What else do I want to do? And, the, you know, and I didn't want to be a contractor or Arabic linguist. And, and so just, uh, I was really curious about how that the, the mechanics of that worked and dove in and it ended up working out really well. It, and it's an amazing thing to think. They're not that smart, I can do that better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Game on. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, because it's like, is, I mean, Arabic is one of the hardest languages in the world to learn. And I'm like, if I can learn that, I can, can learn anything. So it was a, you know, I mean, it's a big math problem and it, I focused a lot of my time and energy on figuring out how to make that work. And it was just, it was a good timing for, um, kind of self-service advertising as Google and Facebook were launching those platforms. So the timing was right as well, where it wasn't saturated, but figured it out and was able to um, retire from the restaurant industry at that time and support myself um, making money on the internet, which was really cool. And the biggest business that you built was a print syndicate, which went from nothing, a business that you started, to selling $40 million of things to people on the internet in just four years. And that's a phenomenal revenue to go from like zero to that number in four years is insane. Yeah, so it's it's funny because um, 
you know, a lot of people think I built a t-shirt company uh, with lookhuman.com and Activate Apparel and my favorite brand, americamade.com. Okay. Actually, I have to pronounce it properly. It's America Made. Uh, but that, and, and, you know, so my mom, if you ever asked her, said I bought a, brought, built a t-shirt company. Um, but, you know, from my view, the whole time we were building a company that was in the business of self-expression. So in the world of selfies and people diving in online to their tribes and these social identities that they are just focused on, uh, you know, a lot of apparel companies and fashion brands were not focused on creating opportunities for people to express themselves in unique ways. And so we, one of our early bestsellers was Introverts Unite, we're here, we're uncomfortable and we want to go home. And so many successful people, when, you, when they speak about their business model, they speak about it in completely different terms. And I love how you didn't see yourself as running a t-shirt company. This was almost a vehicle for people to up their game when it comes to their identity and how they express themselves. Totally, and you know, because they literally put this object on their bodies. And, you know, and what was so powerful is the t-shirt industry is completely saturated. You know, you can get t-shirts for $6, you can go to a thrift store with a dollar and come out with an armload of cool vintage shirts. So no one in America, not even poor people need t-shirts. Like they're, you know, they, they go to waste. And yet we were selling t-shirts on the internet at premium prices because we fulfilled something deeper which is about belonging and self-expression and not about trying to schlep products uh, to people. So that was really, from my view, the distinction on what we did in that business and why it was so successful. And it was almost a business for people that didn't quite fit in as well. Totally, totally, yes. And, you know, like all of our designers were definitely odd birds, <laughs> run by odd birds. So it was, yeah, and it was very, very, and it still is very, very focused on people that uh, maybe no one else is making product for. And as part of running that business, you became one of only 24 black women in America to raise over a million dollars in venture funding, which is fantastic. but quite scary at the same time. It's great to be part of that cohort and I had the chance to meet this um, amazing crew of women who are phenomenal, phenomenal entrepreneurs. You know, but it is very frustrating because if, you know, if I were a straight white dude that dropped out of an Ivy League university, I would have no trouble raising millions of dollars to start, you know, and attempt a business. And, um, you know, so it's just a larger commentary on the lack of equity uh, and equality for women and women of color and people of color to, to you know, um, play on the same field. What obstacles have, have you seen and, and why do you think there are only 24 black women that have managed to raise that much money? I, mean, I would say for me, I have had to just really enjoy being underestimated. <laughs> <laughs> I don't own a suit, I don't wear dresses, and, uh, you know, and over all these years I've just learned to, to love that because if I, if I reacted differently, I would just be angry all the time. Uh, but I think, you know, I think that that's, that's a big, big challenge is that people underestimate um, women and minorities and their capacity in business because, you know, a lot of investors think to pattern detection and it's straight white dudes that have built these billion and IPO these billion dollar companies. Um, you know, but that pattern has to be broken at some point. So despite the fact that you enjoy being underestimated, I mean, what you, what you built and the speed that you did it, there's very few businesses I've ever heard of that went from zero to 40 million of sales in four years. And from my experience of doing a business quickly, that must have been a hell of an intense journey. Oh, <laughs> it is. <laughs> Egg sale. Oh, it is, a, it's painful and brutal. And there is such a thing as growing too fast and it's an absolute shit show and it hurts and it's hard on the team and you know we shed our skin so many times like not like very few people can survive the journey um so it's really hard it's really 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 hard and i you know I, a lot of people are like hey i think i want to do a startup or build a business because my boss is an asshole and i'm like whoa that is the worst reason to jump into the fray or like I want to control my own schedule and it's like okay your schedule will be controlled by assholes actually <laughs> <laughs> so it's um, it's yeah it's brutally hard and painful but also from my view so rewarding to literally have the opportunity to move the needle every single day hopefully forward and not backwards um, for me I think business building is a huge mechanism to have impact 
on how you treat your team because you know my team grew to over 100 people when we paid living wages we gave great benefits we did community service projects and so as a small company we did over 2,000 hours of community service in a year and you know so just in thinking of how do we make it matter that that company exists and that's something that really drives me on why I want why leadership is so interesting to me what do you hear when someone says no fear sometimes resistance and an opportunity to figure out a way. I mean, there is always a path to do almost anything. What do you hear when someone says, that can't be done? <laughs> the fuck it can't, is <laughs> <laughs> what my, my voice in my head says, where, um, you know, I mean, so many people said selling t-shirts on the internet is a saturated market, nobody needs t-shirts, and I actually agree that no one needs them. Um, you know, so it's really, I think people don't necessarily think about things, they try, to think in linear ways or they you know, don't have an expansive enough imagination to figure out how to get something done. And you recently delivered a talk, and I love the title of the talk, uh, it was We Don't Want Nazis Drinking Our Beer. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, you know, I think especially, um, you know, for us in the US but all over the world, it's a really strange time where there's a lot of polarization in, in terms of people's political and personal views, and it's a very divisive time. And you know, I think a lot of brands and companies are not really standing up and saying anything because they don't want to upset anyone. And you know, as an ultra minority, <laughs> I uh, you know can't sit by and think, well, we just you know we don't want to upset the Nazis. So the, based on the title of that talk, a friend of mine said, "T like." you might upset people <laughs> by saying, like, we don't want Nazis. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, this is America. We all should hate Nazis. We all hate Nazis. Like, it, and we don't want their Nazi money. <laughs> and, you know, and then from there... <laughs> old old Deutschmarks or yeah, something. Yeah. <laughs> and, but from there, I like to unpack that further, which is also we don't want racists, homophobes, misogynists, xenophobes, climate change deniers or pussy grabbers <laughs> <laughs> buying our beer. Like, we're out. <laughs> Definitely not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think, I think a lot more brands and companies should speak out. And, you know, so if the Nazis are like, fuck you, that's totally fine. But I think everyone else left standing will, will be with us. We can't be afraid to take a stand or nail our colors to the mask for something that we, that we believe in and make our voice heard and like, try and do something beyond just making beer, try and do some good and try and like move a debate forward. Yeah, because otherwise, like, what are we doing? I mean, like, that's not interesting to me to sit idly by while the world is imploding. <laughs> <laughs> And you famously discourage people from starting up businesses. Why? <laughs> I think people, um, I, I think in order to start a business, it, it has to be driven by intense focus and passion and not an arbitrary decision to want to build a business or start a business. Um, you know, as I talk to great entrepreneurs and, and having built companies myself, it's always been on a fixation that I could never, ever, ever put down. It wasn't necessarily that there was a business plan or an intent to build something specifically, but just I see this opportunity and I cannot not do it. And I think those people should absolutely build businesses, but a lot of people think startups are cool, business building is cool, and they, uh, they don't have a fixation. And without that, you can't survive the the pain and the process. But business building is cool. It's just like sitting about in a nice coffee shop with a laptop <laughs> doing like brainstorming all day, like having a few coffees and just chilling. Yeah, yeah. That's totally. all it is basically. Yeah, yeah. you know, you can sleep in and <laughs> do whatever you want. And You're your own boss. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Nobody to answer to. Yeah. No, I think that, you know, that it's, it's so it's so hard. And now you're CEO of this business here yeah. uh, today, uh, Dog USA. So how did you, how did you end up here? Oh, so that's a, actually there's kind of a funny story behind <laughs> that. So, um, so the company that provided health benefits for my business also does health benefits for BrewDog, and you reached out to one of those guys and said, "Hey, Adam, yeah. we're looking for uh, someone to run the U.S. Do you know anybody?" And Adam said, "T, do you want to go meet James Watt?" And I said, "Who's James Watt?" <laughs> and said, "Let's go down this afternoon." So we drove down, and Adam was like, "T, you and James, I'll do my best about it." <laughs> T, you and James are like the same people. You're both so intense. Like, basically, 
James is the white tea, and I'm going <laughs> to tell him. And I was like, don't tell him that. Don't, don't do that. That's weird. <laughs> so we walk in <laughs> to your office, and Adam says, James, this is tea. <laughs> tea, James. James is the white tea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, th I think it was actually the white straight tea. Yeah, the white straight tea, <laughs> right, right, yes. And then Adam sat there the whole time while you and I, I would say, did a whole discussion of intellectual jujitsu on business building and stuff. So, um, you know, I, uh, I had a lot of reservations about considering because I've generally thought of myself as completely unemployable. <laughs> I swear a lot. I, um, you know, am willful and have my own views on how to do stuff. I don't own a suit, and um, you know. So, but it, you know, after going through the process, I think the the, the big driver for me with BrewDog is I see a business as an opportunity and a lever for impact, and I did not have to reorient any part of how I believe a business should be built in terms of how to take care, great care of your people and your customers. So there's like absolute alignment on how I would run BrewDog if it was my very own business versus what you guys have already built. And so it was a very easy decision to step in and be part of this team. And the, the really amazing thing though, that's different than being a founding CEO is that I have a cohort of experts that I can rely on. So I'm not necessarily as alone as in building and founding my, my own business. So yeah, it's a, it's a perfect fit. And everyone who I've like heard about it was like, holy shit, that is so perfect. And it really is. It's, I'm having a, a great time, but it is fucking brutal. <laughs> <laughs> so if there, was a, if there was a 15 year old Tanisha 2.0 growing up in Missouri today, in the same situation, in the same small town, what advice would you give her? Um, I would say, I would tell her not to compromise uh, and, and to, to stay the course on being herself. Um, because despite my mother's advice and a lot of people advi uh, people's advice, I have always chosen to be who I am and um, adamant, adamantly chosen that and it's worked out really, really well. Uh, but it's scary when you, don't get fit, when you don't fit in and you're getting made fun of and you feel alone to be committed to that, but I'm glad I, I'm really glad I did. I don't think anyone who meets you would doubt for a second how committed you are <laughs> yeah. to anything, anything that you do, yeah. which, is, uh, yeah. which is pretty inspiring. To your story, your energy, your passion is just so inspiring. Thanks for hanging out and you are the complete embodiment of a 21st century business punk. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>